Let's look at the principle of least action and what this can tell us about a physical system, as well as how it can result in the Euler-Lagrange equations. Now, the Lagrangian, which contains some inf important information about a system, is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. We'll use the letters T and V for that. The integral of the Lagrangian with respect to time gives us a new quantity called the action. We'll use the letter S for that. This action takes a function as its argument and returns a number. That function is the Lagrangian. Now all physical systems follow the path of least action. So you can pick any two points in time and there'll be an infinite number of paths between the system, well, physically it is, in, in a coordinate space, through which the system could have evolved from x of t1 to x of t2. But the actual path the system takes is the path of least action. So more formally, the path taken by a system between two points in time, t1 and t2, is that for which the action is stationary. So here's a diagram. And we have the system at t1, this point here, the system at t2, there's clearly an infinite number of paths between there, but there's only one actual path that the system takes, and it's finding that actual path that we want to achieve. And this is where the action comes in. And we find this path by minimising the variance of the action. So that is, we have a minimal term S and a variation term delta S. And the path followed by the system is one for which delta S is zero. And that can be, delta S can be thought of as this form here. Both these two mean the same. And we set that to zero. So as an example, we're going to consider a particle moving in one dimension under the influence of some potential. So here's the Lagrangian. Here, x dot is dx dt, and x of t is the path followed by the particle. Now to vary the action, we do that by varying the coordinate x which specifies the path the particle follows. So we get x, and then we vary it with this delta x term. So the variation in the Lagrangian is then the Lagrangian, the original one, plus the variation part. And we do that by varying the coordinate x. So we substitute that in, this expression here. Okay, when we expand it out, we get this term here, minus this potential term. Now, notice this delta x dot squared. Now, delta x or delta x dot is a very small quantity. And so delta x dot squared will be much, much smaller, be more rapidly going to zero. So as a good approximation, we can set this term here to zero because it more rapidly approaches zero than this term does. And this term is already vanishingly small, infinitesimally small. So for a good approximation, this term is zero. This leaves us with this line here. And what we can do is expand that out and collect the original Lagrangian terms, the terms that form the original Lagrangian, and then the variational part. So this is L, and this is delta L. Also for small delta x, v of x plus delta x is approximately v of x plus dv dx delta x. You might think back to secondary school, high school calculus. Um, if you take away the limit as delta x approaches zero, and rearrange this term, then for small delta x, this expression is approximately true. And that comes from your standard derivative, first derivative of a function f of x. So now we have the variation of the Lagrangian, is this object here these two terms. But it turns out that the first term on the right here can be rewritten as this using the product rule for derivatives or the Leibniz rule. And we'll expand it out a little bit further to see where that leads us. Alright, here we go. Um, dx dot dt times delta x. Over here x dot d dt delta x. Alright, this uh, term here is the second derivative of x, so we get x double dot delta x plus mx delta x dot. Notice in going from this line to this line that the delta variation and the derivative are interchangeable. Um, so this holds something to note when dealing with variation.
This leads us to the variation in Lagrangian as being this object here. Those three terms. Now, at the endpoints, as we saw in the earlier diagram, the endpoints are fixed, so there's no variation in the endpoints. So the delta x1 of t equals delta of x2 of t is zero. The endpoints are fixed, they don't vary. The variation in the action, then, is the integral with this variation in the Lagrangian. Put these terms in, as we saw on the previous page, this section here. All right. This first bit, though, something interesting happens here. You've got the derivative of this, and then the integral of it. Now, m is just a constant, a scalar, you take that outside there. And then the integral and the derivative, inverses of each other, cancel each other out. And we're left with this expression here, m times the original object here, but evaluated at the boundaries, t1 and t2. Now, we know delta x1 and delta x2 at the boundaries disappear. That we saw up here. That we saw over here. And that just leaves us with this object over here, which comes down to the next line. So this bit here is zero, as we saw up here. No variation in the boundaries, so this term here disappears. And we're left with this object here. Okay, now, so just re repeating what we found. The variation in S is equal to this, the variation in the action, sorry, is equal to the, this object here. Okay. But we need delta s to be zero. But delta x is totally arbitrary. This variation in x could be anything. So it's totally arbitrary. The only way this whole object will go to zero is if this business in the brackets in the integrand is zero. For that to be true then, mx double dot plus dv dx is zero, or mx double dot is minus dv dx. This is just the familiar Newtonian equation of motion governing the dynamics of a particle in one dimension. So we've used the variation of the action, the principle of least action, to find the equations of motion for a particle in one dimension. And that shows some of the power of using variation of the action. The action is a very important quantity for deriving physical laws. But we can go a little bit further with it. Notice Lagrangian in this example is a function of two variables, x and x dot, so that we could also write the variation in the action as the integral of the variation of Lagrangian, which is a function of x and x dot. All right, now, from Lagrangian, t minus v is this object here. We get that the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the x-coordinate is, do the derivative of this with respect to the x-coordinate, gives us minus dv dx. And this object here, the time-based derivative of the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x dot, will give us d dt of mx dot, differentiate this object here, we'll end up with mx dot, d dt of that, and that will give us mx double dot. Now if we subtract this equation from this one, we end up with where we started again, the variation of the action, that term delta s, which we then set to zero or the object within the integram we set to zero. And this leads to delta s is, at least in one dimension, we end up with this object here. And the condition that dl dx minus d dt of dl dx dot is zero is known as the Euler-Lagrange equation in one dimension. If we want to generalize it, we go over here, and when we extend to higher dimensions using generalized coordinates, x mu, in x0, x1, x2, however many dimensions you want, it becomes dl dx mu minus d dt dl dx dot mu is zero. That's the Euler-Lagrange equation in generalized coordinates for however many dimensions you have, n dimensions. And that shows how the variation of the action is a very important principle, very important tool for um, finding how physical systems behave by minimizing the action. Very important tool. So that was an introduction to it. And we'll finish there.